to Inside the Hive. Got a great show on the way for you this evening. We've got another 60 second challenge. We're going to add another player to our greatest Watford 11 on tonight's show, plus another round of Ask Tommy. So make sure you stick around for that. Now, tonight's guest is one of our current golden girls. So that does mean uh, we had to record this interview a little bit earlier on this afternoon, because if you're a regular watcher of Inside the Hive, you'll know that the golden girls train on a Thursday night. So unfortunately, that does mean you can't send your questions in tonight. Uh, but of course, you can put comments in of course on the YouTube section below if you're watching uh, always good to get your thoughts on the show as well and if you did submit a question earlier on today when the question came up on the Instagram channel to pose your questions your question may well be asked on the show anyway let's get on with it shall we because a little bit earlier on me and Tommy were joined by the Golden Girls captain and of course that centurion of the Wales international women's football team Helen Ward Tommy, Helen, good to have you here with us. Uh, Tommy, first of all, how's your week been? How good was the Masters, by the way, Sunday? Very good. Sunday was the only day I got to watch every shot, so I enjoyed it. It's a great week. Um, and Helen, your week was much more exciting than us sat around <laughs> watching the Masters. Uh, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. It's uh, been busy, a lot of air miles, but no, it's been a good week. Amazing. Um, let's get stuck straight into it. Obviously, Watford fan, play for Watford. An incredible career so far. We're going to delve more into the international side of things a little bit later on. But for, for you growing up to now be sat here playing for Watford, the club you, you support, how special is that for you? Yeah, it's amazing. I'm sat here next to one of my heroes, Mr Mooney himself. But um, no, it is. I'm a born and bred Watford fan. My parents live 10 minutes down the road. And yeah, to be the captain of the club I love is, is something that's very special to me. Mm, obviously, the captain as well. Um, that's always a tremendous honour, isn't it? Yeah, um, I don't know if it, I got that through default because I'm about 100 years older than anyone else <laughs> in the team. Um, but I'll take it. And yeah, it's a, it's a role that I take a lot of pride in. Um, and hopefully the girls and, and the club think that it's something that suits me. So yeah, it's a, it's a big honour to wear that armband. But I'd like to think I'd act in the same manner whether I had it on my arm or not. Mm. Um, Tommy, obviously, we're very lucky to have a player like Helen playing for Watford. It's always nice when it's someone that supports the club as well that has created such a legacy here. But a great goal scorer, tremendous player and a great captain as well. It's a great story, isn't it? You know, it's, Helen and I have spoken about it before, but when, when one person goes all the way through the football club and then for me as well, the captain's a, a big thing. I, I don't think you should play that down. <laughs> you, you, you know you wouldn't have been given that armband unless you completely deserved it. And I think that that, that that's the full story of it. And it's, you know, it's very, very rare, certainly in the men's game, very rare. Um, and I think it, it shouldn't be overlooked. I think it's a tremendous achievement. Mm. Let's look at your career as well as a whole, because stints at Arsenal, Chelsea, Reading as well. Um, and obviously two of those sides with, with, with Chelsea and Arsenal were kind of big names in the women's game. And you see what Chelsea are doing now, what Arsenal have done over the years as well. Um, when you look back at your time at those clubs, mm. it was something that was an incredible time for you? Yeah, so when I, when I signed for Arsenal, um, I was having a, a good spell at Watford at the time. We'd been promoted into what is the equivalent of the WSL now. It's called the National Premier League. Um, when we were doing all right, we were mid-table, you know, first time in that division. Um, and then a couple of clubs sort of came in for me just before Christmas. And I thought, no, I'm a Watford girl. And then Arsenal came in. Suddenly the decision became a bit different um, because they were, I mean, they still are right up there, but they were the team at the time. They won everything. They were in the Champions League. I think a couple of years before they'd won the Champions League. So to be asked to sign for a club like that, it took a lot of thinking about and I made the difficult decision to leave Watford and go over there. And I learned a lot in the, in the two years I had there. I was lucky enough to win a couple of league titles and an FA Cup. Um, and I was exposed to a, a bit of a different world, although it was still part time. Um, you know, we trained less then than we do now at Watford, which kind of shows how far football has come or women's football has come. Um, but we were fully integrated at, at the training ground, use of the first team bus, little things like that, that you don't really, you, you maybe take for granted, but they make a big difference. Um, and that was the first time I sort of saw the more professional side of football. Um, and then, yeah, going to Chelsea is very much the same story. Um, obviously the facilities at Cobham are unbelievable. And, you know, they've gone on to achieve unbelievable things since then, since Emma Hayes took over and, and are obviously in part of a fully professional league. So it was definitely an eye opener. Um, but all the way through, you know, my time at Arsenal, Chelsea and, and at Reading, 
my heart was always at Watford and, and the idea was always to come back here and hopefully finish my career and I'm thankful that I was given the opportunity to do that back in 2017. And how did that come about coming home? Um, well I was about eight and a half months pregnant with my my boy Charlie. I'd had Emily a few years before that and uh, I was looking for a new club and I was actually just about to sign for Spurs and then the manager Keith at the time he called me and said no don't make any decisions let I'll bring you in and I spoke to himself the general manager Ed and Rich Walker who's obviously still here and they convinced me to come home and you know supported me through having a young family as well and understood that that is something else that's a massive part of my life um, but they made it work and you know I'm very grateful that they did and you know they, they managed to get my signature. No, massively and say as Tommy said it's a special thing to kind of play for that club that that means a lot to you. Um, you like to score a few goals as well <laughs> just just like Tommy. Um, I guess Tommy in, in any league it, it's never easy to score goals. Um, you've got to have something special about you to get as many goals for club and international as Helen has. It's often said in the game, it's the hardest part of the game is to put the ball in the net. But I think women's game, men's game, when you look back, which fortunately you don't have to do yet, <laughs> but when you look back, statistics never lie. And Helen's uh, are up there with very, very few people in the world, male or female, could beat those statistics. And, and I think that that should be revered, certainly a lot more. Um, and perhaps w when you actually hang up the match boots, it'll be looked upon a little bit a little bit more than it currently is but you still have that chance <laughs> to add to those stats and that's that's perhaps the, the bit that I'm perhaps a little bit jealous of mm. you know Helen got the chance to come back to the club there's a story about me coming back to the club but I never did and I think you should you know hold on to that because it, it, it'll mean an awful lot in the years to come thank you mm. do you wish you'd come back I, I wish I'd been given the chance yeah, yeah. I'd have been 34 35 so it would be a different Tommy Mooney than the one that the Watford supporters remembered, but I think I could have done a job. Mm, nice. Um, we're going to talk into to legacy a bit more when we kind of talk about the international side of things for you, but when you first started playing football, we were speaking before Tommy got here and you, know, you grew up watching players like Tommy and they inspired you. The women's game has come on massively in the last few years, but I guess from that first opportunity you had to, to come and play for Watford, the game has mm. changed massively since then. Yeah, hugely. Yeah, my heroes were the likes of Tommy and male footballers um, because there was no platform for women's football. I didn't know anything about any other female teams. I was just enjoying it as a kid, playing every weekend, training in the week. Um, there was nothing on the TV or in the papers, anything like that. Probably didn't even think about the fact that international football was a thing for female players. It was just, I played for enjoyment, um, but it's so nice now. You know, we've had a few games out there on the on the pitch at Vicarage Road and I think I've said it so many times in interviews, if you can see it, you can be it. And that's what the best thing for me, the difference from when I was a kid to the young girls now, they can see it, they can access games, they can see it on the TV, they can read about it in the papers. Social media, you know, for all the, the bad things that come from social media, there's so many good things as well. And I think women's football in particular um, has sort of jumped on that and and made it a place where supporters can access players, you know, hopefully 99% of the time for good reasons, you know, and, and interact with us. And I think that's a big thing. Um, How does that affect you knowing that there's young girls in the crowd dreaming that one day they can do what you've done? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, I think I mentioned her on this show before, but there's a little girl called Isla who I met through a family friend um, and she's a massive, she's a mad Watford fan, both men and women. She's a, as many games as she can get to. Um, she's sent me cards in the past and little posters that she's made. And to know that me playing football is doing that for her. And she dreams of being a footballer herself one day. And her mum said on, when we first played here at the start of the season, that she said, that'll be me one day. And I thought that's, nice. that's exactly why we do it. Um, and to know that, you know, my kids as well, their friends, not just girls, but boys as well, seeing women playing at that level um, and taking it as normal and enjoying it as much that's as they the enjoy, in the, you know, enjoying it alongside the men's game. It doesn't have to be either or. And I think that's the kind of thing that people haven't understood at times. That you can enjoy both. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably if hand on my heart is probably the best part of my career is is trying to inspire the younger, younger players, for sure. Mm.
you told me spoken before about how special Vicarage Road is for, for the players and, and getting to play here. You mentioned those games here this year. It's been great to see the crowds and mm. especially that last game was, it was a lot more in as well, which was amazing. But I love that interaction at full time as well. What was it, I guess, what did it mean to you and the team to get the opportunity to play here so far this season? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I missed the, the last one because I had COVID. Finally got me after two years. Um, but the crowds have been growing all season and to go over, like you said, and interact with them after the games and no matter what the result's been, you know, we've had a couple of defeats, we've had a draw and we've had a victory here. Um, but the reaction's always been the same. The support has always been incredible um, and we're really grateful for that and it inspires us to go out there and put a performance on and hopefully in, in return it inspires them to, to go home and, you know, want to be a footballer themselves or enjoy watching football at whatever level. So, yeah, it's been great to be here and, and hopefully there's many more games to come. Yeah, for sure. Fingers crossed. And uh, plenty more still to come on the show as well. We're going to talk more about Helen's career. We're going to talk about uh, internationals as well, more about Watford as well. Uh, but now let's turn our attention to the game at the weekend. Tommy, of course, uh, you're on commentary for that one. Um, disappointing defeat to Leeds at the weekend. We talked about it last week. It was one of those games. It was one of these cup finals that Ray Lewington kind of pitched to us the other week and disappointing not to get something out of it. Really disappointing. Yeah, I think it, it was a huge game. It, it was a must win game. Um, we, we can't deny that fact and there was parts of the game up until the second goal went in we were still in the game and you thought at some point we're going to score here and then if we do it quick enough we can go on and win because the momentum would swing so quickly and that's what we were hoping for wishing for uh, but it just didn't do that and when the second goal went in it, it you could see it, it killed the momentum that that the boys had had started to started to acquire um, but then the other result with Norwich and Burnley still gives you a, a fighting chance. You've just mm -hmm. got to find that fighting spirit. We can't wait till the last game of the season. It's too late then. We have to find that fighting spirit now and come out fighting. Mm -hmm. Helen, how difficult is that sometimes when you're on a, a run of defeats and you really need to get those wins from a mindset perspective and around the dressing room perspective? It, it can't be an easy time. Yeah, we've been there ourselves this season and, and it's not a nice place to be because you do wonder when that next victory is going to come. But then you get that little break you get a moment in a game or, you know, even a moment in another game with a team around you and it gives you that little spark and you, it's just then you have to take that spark and, and use it. And like Tommy said, you don't want to be counting down the games and getting towards, you know, where it is literally, there's no room for, for, for error. Um, you want to try and grab onto those moments and, and make the most of them like they did at Southampton a few weeks ago. You know, it almost came out of nowhere that win, but... You've, got, you've just got to grab those opportunities and when they come you enjoy them but you make sure that you're ready then for the next one and, and at, at times you win a game and then the performance drops and it's all, almost all for nothing. Um, you've just got to try and build a momentum as best you can and snap out of the bad momentum that you might be in. Mm. That's the key to it, is that Southampton performance gave us hope because it was a really good performance. Mm. It wasn't a fortunate win, it was a comfortable win and could have been a lot more and you just want to take that into the next game. We both know it's not as easy as that, but for any success in this game, you have to be build momentum towards the end of the season, whether that's teams going for promotion or to try and stay in the division. And you know, you can't wait till three or four games left because you're, people are already looking at league tables and in some divisions there's red, red lines through names. I don't want to see that here. No. no we certainly want to see that. Uh, let's get some post-match reaction uh, from that game because we spoke to uh, Christian Cabaselli. Is it down to errors costing you, do you feel? Yes, we can say that. Um, all, the, all the goals from Leeds come from uh, from us not being uh, ruthless enough in, enough in defence. Uh, yeah, so we cannot, uh, we cannot claim a lot today. This was a big game, a vital game for both sides for obvious reasons. How much here and now of a missed opportunity does it feel for Watford? Yeah, it's a big one. We, we, we've told before the game, we have uh, five games at home. We have to, to win the, the five games. Uh, we lost this one, but you know, uh, until it's not done uh, mathematically, we will keep, uh, we'll keep pushing, keep fighting. Uh, I think our fans deserve better than that because nine, nine defeats in a row, it's unacceptable. So um, we will keep working N next week, another big game, and uh, you can be sure that we will not, uh, will not give up. Well, thoughts of Christy and Cavastelli there, of course. Can't do anything about that result. That game's gone. Tommy, we've got to refocus now and, and move forward. And, of course, Brentford up next this weekend. Yeah, and that's a big game. 
It's a big game for me because you know of my feelings. We well, you know your Brentford. feelings about Brentford after the after the away game. After the away game, when they did a lap of honour, I, I, <laughs> I was a very was angry indeed. man leaving the stadium, <laughs> and I've got to be honest with you. Didn't quite calm down until I got onto the second motorway of the night. I was very angry. I'd really like to beat them this weekend. Not just for the three points. Yeah. I just want to get a little bit of eye contact with the manager. Nice. That's it. I'll leave it there. <laughs> going to leave it there. Going to leave it there. Uh, well, someone that's been looking forward to the game this week uh, is Imran Luza. Imran, merci d'être avec nous. Watford, c'est votre premier club à part Nantes. Là où vous avez été formé. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous, nous expliquer un peu comment ça s'est passé, euh, cette arrivée ici C'est nouveau pour vous C'était la première fois que vous allez dans un autre club Comment ça s'est passé bah Déjà, c'est une, une belle découverte. Voilà, découvrir un, un championnat, une nouvelle ville, une nouvelle langue. Ce n'est euh, pas, pas un choix facile au départ, mais c'est un, un challenge. Et euh, voilà, j'ai voulu l'accepter le, le, avec... Euh, avec beaucoup d'objectifs et, et je pense que ça a été le, le meilleur choix aujourd'hui d'être venu ici. Et justement, cette adaptation ici en, en Angleterre C'est comment... bah sûr que c'est un, un changement radical, surtout quand j'ai fait toutes mes classes à Nantes. Changer comme ça, ça n'a pas été facile au début. Voilà, j'ai pas envie de, 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 de mentir sur, sur ça. Ça n'a pas été un, un moment facile, quitter la famille, quitter les amis. Mais, mais j'étais déterminé euh, à, à l'idée d'être de, 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 heureux et d'être d'abord heureux et pratiquer, pratiquer euh, mon football. Et voilà, je suis, de, je suis, je suis dans l'un des championnats les, les plus cotés de, du monde. Donc, il faut que, faut que je profite. Et aujourd'hui, encore une fois, ça, ça a été euh, un bon choix. Cette équipe de Watford, elle n'a pas une saison facile est-ce que vous pouvez nous, nous décrire un peu les différents moments de cette saison Comment vous les avez ressentis, vous Non, c'est sûr, ce n'est pas une saison facile. Mais euh, je l'ai connue aussi l'année dernière à Nantes. C'est ma petite expérience. Euh, je sais que rien n'est joué jusqu'au bout déjà. Donc, il va, va falloir se battre. Et pour ma part, il y, y a eu deux parties. Il y a eu la première partie où je ne jouais pas trop, où j'observais. Euh, J'essayais d'être avec l'équipe, de les encourager un maximum. Et il y, y a eu la, la deuxième partie où j'ai un peu plus participé, j'ai un peu plus joué. Et là, j'ai essayé de donner un peu plus mon, mon grain de sel à, à l'équipe. Et euh, je vais essayer de faire de même pour, pour la suite, pour remporter euh, ces matchs et, et espérer se maintenir. Good to get thoughts there of Imran Loser ahead of that one. Of course, we can see his uh, career stats there uh, so far for Watford, of course, uh, since he joined us in 2021. Um, tell me, what's been your impression so far this season? Technically very, very good. I think it helps him with Musa Sissoko in the, in the middle of the pitch. Um, we could do with a few of those goals that are on his, that are on his stats. But I think he, he's got an excellent range of passing. Perhaps he's a step ahead of, of a couple of the strikers. Um, they're perhaps slow making their runs, but I, I, I like him, very technically gifted. Mm. How about you, Helen? Yeah, they're very much the same. I think if we can maintain Premier League status, he could become a, a very important player. I think the Premier League suits him perhaps more so than the Championship would, just because of that physical side. But I think considering the start he had at Watford and a difficult debut, the way he's come back shows he's got a good mentality because he has one of been been one of the standout players for us in a, in a difficult time this season. No, massively, of course, we need uh, all the players to step up to the plate this weekend. Um, of course, Brentford is the team we're up against. They came up with us last year. We can take a look at their recent form and see how, how they've gotten recently. Of course, that man, Christian Eriksen, is certainly uh, making some headlines since he's been back there. You know, they picked up that win against Chelsea the other week, which I think surprised a lot of people. Um, Tommy, what have we got to do as a side this weekend to get something out of this? Of course, Roy, off the back of the last game, said, you know, we've got to rem remind ourselves of the positives from these last couple of games. Um, but what have you got to do to, to beat a Brentford side? We have to start on the front foot and we have to take the game to them. I think the Ericsson signing is a great signing because it gives the whole dressing room a lift. When top, top players you work with on a daily basis, uh, it lifts your game because you want to impress them. You don't just want to impress the staff and the supporters, you want to impress the best players in the dressing room. And I think that's what's happened with Brentford by signing. Christian so uh, that's what's lift their game I, I don't think you, you can take the Chelsea game as because that was a poor Chelsea performance as opposed to a good Brentford one but they've won the game in the Premier League that's not easy to do so I, I wouldn't overlook that um, having said that from the game um, earlier on in the season against them 
we were so comfortably on top for 45 minutes. It was probably our best 45 minute performance. And then it was a complete contrast in the second half. We can't afford to do that. We need to extend that to an hour, 90 minutes ideally, but we know that that's unrealistic. Uh, but certainly take the game to them and test them defensively because yeah. I think they're bang average defensively. Yeah. Um, just a word on Christian Eriksen, potentially one of the best free transfers of all time that the club's managed to pick up. And obviously it's great to see him back on a pitch after obviously what we had to, what we witnessed last year as well. Yeah, I mean, when you look at, you know, no disrespect to Brentford, but when a superstar signs for a club that is not a massive club, newly into the Premier League, it is, it's an eye-opener. Um, I think had he gone to a bigger club, you kind of would have said, yeah, OK, that's decent business. But because a side like Brentford have signed him um, and with everything, like you said, that happened last summer, everybody is kind of wanting him to do well. Obviously not on this, not this, not this game. Not but, this weekend. Um, <laughs> but no, it's a feel-good story. And, and like Tommy said, it's, it's something that has obviously boosted their dressing room and, and lifted the players around him because he's still a world-class player. And, you know, I expect him to go and improve that in the World Cup. I was going to say in the summer, but yeah, in the winter. In the winter. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a nice story, but as I said, hopefully hopefully not this weekend. No, yeah, hopefully not. And Tommy, I guess the key, like you said, dominated that first forty five minutes in the uh, reverse fixture. Just got to take our chances. Something that obviously both of you know, being strikers, you just got to do. You got to win games by scoring those goals. You got to take the chances. We have to have somebody that we've mentioned it before. There's always one talisman at the end of a season that that goes and gets the goals to have any sort of success. Um, and we need one of ours to step it up. Cucho Hernandez has scored perhaps more goals than, than any of the others, but still we need more. You need, you need minimum one, ideally two or three. And we can see from the opposition, Brentford have that. They have their goal scorers. They've had Tony all season. You know, they, you, they've got a striker where you expect him to get near that 20 goal mark. Um, we don't have that, so therefore we have to share them out. And at the moment, we're not. That needs to improve. We can't afford in the Premier League. You might get two chances in a game. You have to take one of them mm. at the very, very least. Mm. How does how does that work from a striker's perspective? Do, do you feel the pressure on that when you need to win games? And obviously, you know, you guys are the ones that have got the skills to put it in the back of the net. You know, so obviously you want to take that chance. But do you find sometimes that you know the midfielders are trying to get the goals as well, and they're not giving you the balls because everyone's so desperate to score to get the points? Yeah, I think it. it the pressure does pile on to a whole team if, if everybody's struggling, but as a striker, you probably take it a bit more personally because that's your job and that's what you're judged on. Um, you know, I hadn't scored for Watford for quite a while until the weekend before the international break and to score that first goal was a weight off my shoulders because I knew we needed it as a team and, and I needed it as a player. Um, and it does sometimes lead to you snatching at chances or trying things that you wouldn't normally try. Um, but once you do get that break, then hopefully you can go on that run because it is, it is literally a weight off your shoulders um, and then once one's gone in you feel that confidence thing, you have that belief back in yourself and hopefully you can then go and knock a few more in but certainly something that strikers take personally when, when their team's not scoring. I think perhaps midfielders are prepared to pass the responsibility mm. to the strikers when it gets to this stage of the season because the strikers, were, they have to say give me the ball, you mm. have to because the strikers have to have a different mentality to, to almost any other position on the pitch, I feel, because you have to take that responsibility. In the 18-yard box, if, if they've got the ball, they have to have a touch and score, if not score with their first touch. And, and I think that demand and desire to, to have the ball in goal-scoring areas is perhaps, when we look at our strikers, where you can almost forgive them a cert, to a certain extent because we haven't created as many opportunities as we should. If you create them, and the, ch and the strikers are missing them, then it's their fault. It's the same as when the ball goes from back to front. I always used to say, if the ball is neck down and I, I don't keep possession, it's my fault. If it's seven foot in the air and I'm playing against a <laughs> six foot three striker, then, you know, give me yeah. a chance. So they, they'll know those areas of the pitch that they want the ball. Having the confidence to finish it off is another thing. I think sometimes you get into that mindset of wanting the perfect chance to come. So the chances of you scoring are higher and you're more confident going into it, but you get to a point where you can't afford to wait for that perfect chance because it might not come and you have to start making the most of half chances and snapshot opportunities. And, and that's when you might get your, your lucky break, if you like. Um, but yeah, when, when you're low on confidence, you almost want that, that moment right in front of the centre of the goal, whole goal to aim at and your chances of scoring go up. But in the Premier League particularly, you, you can't wait that long and, and that chance might not arise. So you it's have also to take other chances. It's having time to think about a chance mm. as well, isn't it? We, we both know that the, the, 
the less time you've got to think about a chance, the more chance you've got of scoring with it. Because you start thinking about the things that you practice on the training ground and then you start thinking about, well, the goalkeeper stood where I want to put it. And it, it puts a, creates a little bit of doubt in your mind. And I think that that's, it appears that that's what our strikers have at the moment. They have a little bit of doubt. They have mm. to get rid of that on the training ground. And the only way you can do that is, is getting into those positions on the training ground and you know, imagining there's a crowd there or, or not, it doesn't really matter. It's the ball has to go in that place in the net. You know, pick it, pick a square. A coach will always tell you pick a square. Now, when you look quickly at a net, you think, well, it's a blur. I can't pick a net. <laughs> I can't pick a square. But you have to pick, take it down to small areas in the goal. Mm. You know, as a coach, I used to always put bibs in, in in the corner of the net. So young players and for, uh, even first team players, when I was still playing and you know working with the likes of, uh, of Deeney at Walsall, you sometimes it's easier to see a flash of colour so a yellow mm. bib or a green bib in the corner of the net as opposed to picking that one particular white square did you have a particular spot that you would try and go for did you have like a favorite spot sometimes people do the penalties don't they but obviously in a game play it's slightly a little bit different but do you, do you kind of have a favorite kind of shot that you like to go for if you're in a particular position a particular corner do you prefer going to a keeper's left or i quite like coming off the left side inside the channel where you've got the whole goal to aim at and you open up, keeper thinks you're going to their, their left, but you wrap it in the near post. That's my favourite finish of all time. So mine's the opposite side <laughs> on my left foot. There you go. <laughs> right. so exactly Because you can pick your tries. Yeah. yeah. Whereas when you come in as a right footer from the right hand side, it's difficult to score at the near post. You have to kind of drive it across. Yeah. It's a bit more obvious. But when you come off the opposite side of your stronger foot, then you can pick your spot a little bit more easily. Having said that, I would have always preferred a chance from my head. I was more accurate with my head yeah, yeah. than I was with my feet. So I would have always, if I, if I was praying for a chance in the last minute, I was praying for a header. Get you two down the training ground, don't we? <laughs> right. Uh, big game this weekend, of course, uh, if you're travelling down to that one. Uh, make sure you pick up a match day programme because uh, this week it features Paul Robinson. Of course, you can get that one on a match day. Now, of course, last week, our very own Tommy Mooney was the cover star and you can win one of the programmes signed by Tommy. We've got one of them here. Tommy's already signed it as well. Uh, if you want to get yourself involved on that one, uh, get, you can head to the uh, website, I think, double check website to get yourself on that one. Uh, if you want to win that one, email, there we go. Email if you want to get this one uh, and you could get yourself one of these programmes signed by Tommy. So uh, get involved in that. Do you want one? Yeah, by Tommy, you said he's a hero growing up. There we go. First one given away. We need to get another one signed. Uh, right. Uh, time now for our 60 second challenge. Uh, this week taking it on is Ruby Smith. I'm Ruby Smith and this is my 60 second challenge. Favourite social media channel? Instagram. Ronaldo or Messi? Messi. Favourite food? Uh, pizza. Football manager or FIFA? FIFA. Netflix or Prime? Netflix. Home or away games? Away. City life or country life? Country. Worst teammate to share a room with? Gemma. Favourite movie? Oh, Aaron Brockovich. Favourite TV series? Uh, Orange is New Black. Tea or coffee? Tea. Favourite musician or group? Brent Fires. First car you owned? Suzuki Swift. First Love goal? You. Goal! Watford, I don't know. <laughs> goal! Oh, my last! I'm last! <laughs> what is First football boots? Uh, Predators. Best stadium? Uh, Emirates. Team you supported as a kid? Arsenal. Red sauce or brown sauce? Red. Most famous person on your phone? Oh my god, me. Coach or train to away games? Coach. Worst thing about pre-season? Uh, running. Studs or blades? Blades. Teammate with the worst dance move? Fran Alley. Match day superstition? Oh, uh, shin pads, don't wear them on the wrong foot. 30 yard screamer or solo goal? Screamer. Favourite holiday destination? Spain. Up. I've lost! No! I fumbled the bag! You might not be top of the leaderboard, but you should have seen Tommy's face when he realised he's now dropped down to seventh. <laughs> oh, absolutely gutted. When do I get another goal? <laughs> I think we can still that. Last game, last show of the season, we'll give you one final chance. All right with that? Hang on. Why don't I get another chance? If you want to join us for the last <laughs> show of the season, we can have anyone who wants another go. Last game of the season, come down and we'll just have a 60 second challenge. Fest for the end of it. We'll have a Champions League we'll final. Get doubles. We'll get doubles. Let's, let's doubles to see if we okay. can win it. Yeah, we'll see we'll if you that. both say love actually. <laughs> I'm definitely saying love actually. <laughs> right, uh, time for one of my favourite parts of the show. Uh, Tommy's least favourite part of the show. Uh, Helen, you get to join in with us now because we have a little quiz. Uh, there's going to be yeah, some questions for Tommy now. 
then you're going to have your questions a little bit later on okay. and a little game of Ask Tommy. Ready for this? Don't worry about it, Ellen. Mine will be ridiculous. And he knows I've had a really busy week, so I've done no prep. <laughs> he's done zero Googling. He hasn't Wikipedia'd you before he's got here, oh. so he's in trouble. Okay. Okay, question one. Considering you watched every shot, I'll be disappointed if you don't know the answer to question one. The Masters, last weekend. Roy, Mac Roy McElroy finished second. Great shot on the 18th, by the way. But how many shots under par did he finish? In the final round. Final round. The, the scoreboard says McElroy, how many under par? Oh, so not the final round overall. Overall, how many shots under par? Um, it's the leaderboard. He finished <laughs> he was, second. I'm talking about the leaderboard. He was eight <laughs> under. Seven under. According to the Masters official website. That's the final round he was finished seven under. Was the whole competition, the final leaderboard of the whole competition is seven under? In the final I, round I don't even know who I've won said, it. I, I clearly said the whole competition. Next. Next. <laughs> Neil Poir. Okay. <laughs> You'll like this one. Question number two. Helen made her senior debut for Wales against Luxembourg on the 30th of September 2008. Wales came from behind to win 6-1. But the question is, did Helen score on her debut? Yes or no? Yes. Correct. Second goal of the game. For second Welsh goal. I think you got the second one. Second goal of the game, first Welsh goal. It yeah. was the equaliser. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. You're not doing very well, are you, today? It was the second goal of the game, was right? But you said then said We're the in the Strikers' Union here. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. Yeah. going to beat the Strikers' Union, I'm telling you. I that. know. I'm in trouble. I'm outnumbered normally. <laughs> normally, goalkeepers are heavily involved in this show. Right. Question three. Helen, of course, represents Wales, but she played under 23s for which other home nation before choosing to play for Wales? England. Correct point on the board uh, right for three points question four Gareth Bale has scored 38 goals for Wales Helen has scored how many and it's more 99 <laughs> <laughs> I love your optimism thank you correct answer 44 44 I was gonna have a serious guess to say 46 oh. <laughs> too late now sorry but there we go two points uh, so two points for Tommy. You get the chance to be it a little bit later on the show. And I promise my question answering will be much, uh, question delivering will be much better <laughs> for you on the show. I'm having a shocker today, aren't I? But there we go. Uh, time for the important questions now. There are some of the questions that you have sent in a little bit earlier on today. So a massive thank you to everyone who sent a question in. Uh, 1407 is the first question. Uh, you have a penalty to win the league. Who do you pick in the squad, your, your squad to step up? Do Me. you take it? Yeah. All day long. Tommy, same that. for you. Yeah, I'd rather blame myself than blame somebody else. Like that. Back yourself all day long. Uh, Carla would like to know the best goal you've scored in your career so far. God, that's really tough. Because there's so many of them. The one, technically the best one I scored, was in the FA Cup final playing for Chelsea. I mean, that's a pretty big but, goal. That is. That's but, a big goal, just pick that one up for you. It was in the cup final. But we lost, so oh. it doesn't really... I mean, it meant something at the time, obviously. It put us 1-0 yeah. up until the 88th minute, and then we ended up losing on penalties. But that was probably the best one from, like, if you just isolate it as a goal. Um, the ball came out the air. I managed to have a decent first touch for once, and then on the turn, nutmeg the defender, <laughs> took it onto my left foot and scored. Um, so that was nice, but... I can't look back at it as my favourite because it mm. ended up meaning nothing. Mm. So I can't really answer that one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, Ollie would like to know uh, your best moment as a Watford player so far. I think it's going back to my first spell um, when we got promoted into the the National League um, because I'd come through sort of the pyramid with Watford. We'd done the South East, we'd done the Southern and then we'd got into the National Premier League. So that day where we, we finally clinched promotion, we had a really great side. Um, so to be able to hold that trophy aloft and get us promoted for the first time was really special. So I reckon that's up there, definitely. Nice. Uh, final question for the minute comes from a, a young fan who's uh, dropped us a line uh, called Addy. And she would like to know, who is your favourite 25-year-old Nigerian <laughs> teammate? <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. <laughs> I suppose I'll have to say Addy. I'm picking her up in a bit, that's why I can't be late, but no, she's a good girl. Uh, awesome. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions that you've sent in earlier today. Uh, of course, as mentioned, uh, this is uh, done this a little bit earlier in the day. So if you've sent your questions in earlier on, uh, you may well hear your question a little bit later on in the show. Uh, time now then for the Junior Hornets feature on tonight's show, uh, because they've had a day in the life as a professional. So let's see what they got up to.
Well, a great day for some of our younger fans. They're dreaming of being a professional, just like our guest Helen once was as a young Watford fan, dreaming of being a professional. Um, let's take a look at your stats um, because absolutely incredible. Um, internationally and as a player for, for Watford and all those other teams that, that you've played for as well. When, when you look back and see those numbers, is, do you ever kind of dream you'd achieve those kind of stats and numbers when you first started making your debuts for these clubs and for obviously for your country as well? No, not at all. I think for Watford, because I, I played from sort of age nine upwards and always managed to score a few goals, I don't really think I thought too much about it or what it meant. I think uh, we were speaking before, it's when you look back on your career that you you kind of take notice of the, the numbers. And even for Wales, I think because I scored on my debut and the second game, I believe, and my ratio was pretty good, but I almost took it for granted. Um, the last few years, I've, I kind of realised that I had done pretty well because I've been struggling to find the net <laughs> a little bit more for Wales in recent years. But um, no, it's it's not something I ever dreamed of doing, so to have you know, hit those sorts of numbers is obviously something that I'm, I'm really proud of. Mm. So, I mean, incredible numbers as well when you look at that, you know, like for yourself, you know, the amount of goals you scored as well, you know, to have players of that calibre involved with the club is, is tremendous for, for Watford. Yeah, absolutely. Like we said earlier, the statistics don't lie. And when Helen looks at them, sometimes even while you're playing, when you're having a, a bit of a bad spell, mm. you think when you look at your, your stats, particularly for that st season, because they're relevant. Yeah. You, you know, it can give you a little bit of a lift. And I'm sure looking at your stats, I'd have loved to have look, looked at stats like that <laughs> and said to myself, you know, actually, you, you're not bad. <laughs> but no, I think, it's, I, I think it's great. And the fact that she's still playing and can still add to those stats, yeah. you're only a young pup, aren't you? Still, yeah. I know what the next birthday is, but <laughs> <laughs> you've still got plenty of time. I played till I was 38, 39. Okay. Plenty of time left. Yeah. Plenty of time. Maybe. You run about more than I used to, though, so <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why I got away with it. <laughs> uh, now, of course, uh, an amazing milestone for you. Obviously, 100 caps for, for Wales as well. Um, we've got a little video, which I'm not sure if you've seen yet, but it's some, some great reminiscing moments uh, from you and your time so far with Wales. And then some of your more later caps. Um, number 58 against the back here, when you scored your first goal since the birth of your daughter. And then number 75 against Kazakhstan, which was your first game after you gave birth to your son. When you scored against Durham, your son was there celebrating in the back. What are moments like that now with having a family and, and all these sort of life events? You know, do they sort of change perspective with your job or do they make it even more enjoyable? A bit both. I think they certainly changed the perspective because you realise that your life doesn't just surround football anymore. Um, it still does in, in a lot of ways, but First and foremost, I have to make sure my kids are happy and healthy, um, and that will always be my priority. I like to hope that they are growing up, sort of seeing me and, and other women playing football and, and that being the norm. I think that's huge for kids growing up to see women's football as, as normal um, and be able to support it and enjoy it in the same way that so many people enjoy men's football. Um, and also seeing that if, if you dream big, you can achieve big things, you know, whether that's in football or something else, I want my kids to be able to do that and hopefully they're, they're seeing me do that and they can go out and, and fulfil their own dreams and ambitions. But it certainly does change your perspective um, and that video you mentioned of seeing Charlie in the background, I watched that goal so many times, not, not because I was interested in what I was doing on the pitch, but just to see his little reaction, he was bouncing along uh, by the side of the goal and then suddenly you see his arms go up and yeah it really melted my heart and it's nice to know that they can go along and, and enjoy watching football and you know he's at an age now where he sort of semi understands it and he knows what what end we're supposed to be scoring in and whatever so it's great to have them there you know Emily was there as well and yeah those are the moments that, that make it all worthwhile. Nice obviously sharing with the family is obviously incredibly important um, how special is that for you, especially now coming to the games at Vicarage Road as well and obviously your international career as well, that your, your family could be part of that? Yeah, it's great. And they're at an age now, Emily's seven, Charlie's four, so they, they kind of get it. Um, before, when they were coming as, as little ones, they weren't quite sure what was going on um, and worried about how cold they were getting. But uh, Emily in particular, she loves, loves coming to the big stadiums and she loves coming here to Vicarage Road. Charlie as well, they like coming to the big stadium. Uh, to watch games, I think they feel it's a bit more special and, you know, talking about whether we score goals and learning all the names of the players and stuff. And it's just great like, for them to be able to see so many amazing female role models. Um, it's really good for them to see and, and obviously coming off the pitch, 
whatever the result, I know they're going to give me a hug and you know tell me well done, even if I've been really bad. It's a nice morale booster mm. um, to go back to your kids. When they're older, they might not be quite so kind, but um, no, it's really enjoyable at the moment. Tommy, were your kids that kind? Yeah, they were. It was great. I think as a footballer, you appreciate football more when you've mm. got kids because sometimes you go home after a difficult day and then the kids don't care. Yeah. And, some, and that helped me because I, I, I used to struggle with that after games. I was, but as they got older, they knew if we won, I'd let them stay up and watch Casualty on Saturday <laughs> night. And we'd, and we'd have a takeaway. They want to watch Daddy on well. Match of the Day, Casualty. No, they weren't bothered about that. They just wanted to watch Casualty and stay down in the lounge. And then as they got a little bit older, I'd, I'd say to them, they could go to sleep on, if they fell asleep through Casualty, I'd carry them up. And then they got to the point where I couldn't carry all three of them up at the same time because they were pretending to be asleep. <laughs> so, no, I think, you know, again, and we've talked about it several times, within the women's game, for, for moms to, to have to continue that training regime and, and still have all of the schooling and everything, I, I used to look forward to an overnight stop when the when the kids were first born, just to get a good night's <laughs> sleep and get in the hotel. Um, but I think genuinely that that football becomes more important when you have kids. It, you're quite selfish before you have the children. Mm. I think you just love the game and you love that everything that it brings. But then when the kids come along, it makes you it makes you think twice. I think it puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Like it does mean everything, but it doesn't at the same time makes you enjoy the good moments, yeah. but helps you, like you said, forget about the bad moments. And I think that's probably the best balance to have. Absolutely, yeah. very special. Um, now, when you achieve a milestone of 100 international caps, obviously lots of people want to send you some goodwill messages and, and reflect on your career. And there's a, we can share a few with you now. Hi, Helen. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you on your 100th cap. I'm sure it's going to be an amazing occasion for yourself and um, it'll be in a proud moment for your family. So um, yeah. Hope you enjoy the game, hope the game goes well and uh, welcome to the 100 Club. Hi Helen, Rob Page, um, just wanted to send you a message of congratulations. Um, we're both captain Watford, we've both played for our country. The only one you've done me on is getting 100 caps for your country and that is an amazing achievement. Um, I had the privilege and an honour to be a part of Wayne Hennessy, Chris Gunter and Gareth Bales and um, it's an honour for me to be a part of your celebrations also. I'm coming to the game on Friday, so I'll be cheering the girls on and, um, and it's going to be in a, a great occasion for yourself. So no doubt, knowing you as I do, you will still go all out absolutely to get the win. Um, but enjoy the moment and um, like I said, congratulations again. Well done. To have messages from people like that, how special is that for you? Because, you know, you're quite rightly deserved to be up there and mentioned in the same sentence as people like Gareth Bale and those people that have had those achievements as well. Um, is that quite special for you to, to kind of see messages like that from people that, you know, really, really appreciate what you've done for the Welsh game? Yeah, it was amazing, you know, to come off the pitch on Friday. I had a, had a few messages and, and then when that popped up on my, my phone, it was like, wow, OK, that's, that's pretty cool. And, Thankfully, I've got the video saved to my phone, so something I can look back on and, you know, again, later down the line, probably enjoy even more. But yeah, it was a real nice moment, a nice touch by the guys here at Watford to get that done. Yeah, no, massively. OK, time now then to move on to the Watford Greatest eleven. The team is coming together nicely. There's just a few positions left to select. We need one more midfielder and we need two strikers. And of course, having you here in the studio, it'd be remiss of us, Helen, not to get you to pick one of our strikers uh, for this one this evening. It's obviously... Uh, a tough task trying to pick a striker for a greatest 11. It is, it's very tough. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be a, a season ticket holder for over 25 years, so I've seen a few strikers give it a go. Um, so yeah, it wasn't an easy job at all. Okay, let's start off then with your contenders and uh, Igalo is your first contender. Yeah, I just think um, he sort of came out of nowhere, didn't he? As so many of the Pozzo signings have. Um, I didn't know much about him. Uh, but that season when he came in and, you know, him, Troy and uh, Vidra, that front line that got us promoted was unbelievable. But I just thought the class he had, the, the composure in front of goal to, to get himself in a position to finish was incredible. And, and then in that first season in the Premier League, I thought he, particularly the first half of the season was unbelievable. And, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame when he had to leave. And I don't think we've ever really replaced him as that type of forward. But yeah, he was, he was brilliant for the few years that he was here. Yeah, I think he's, you know, he's one of those that definitely takes responsibility to when chances come his way. If you speak to Troy, he takes too much responsibility because he'd like to pass on to. <laughs> but 
apart from his smoke alarm going off when he does inside yes. the hive. <laughs> I completely That's agree. Brilliant. I think he's, he, he was excellent for the club at the time. Nice. Um, I just want to check that that's right and it's not a typo. <laughs> um, it is right. Uh, your second nominee? Mr Mooney himself. Tommy, you've made the nominees list. That's, that's the surprise of the decade. For me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Helen, talk us through why, why you've put Tommy on that contenders list. I mean, as I said, I've been a fan for a long time and uh, the season we went up to the Premier League for the first time in in 99 was special and Tommy was a big part of that, seeing the... Uh, <laughs> The goal he scored at Anfield that's gone down in history and yeah, that, that sort of, the age I was at watching you play um, was very much enjoyable and I met you a few times when I was a kid, you were always very personable with the fans, which, which means a lot, you know, in that, that Graham Taylor era. I met Lou for a few times as well, but I'm not quite old enough to have seen him play, so you've made it in the list. <laughs> but no, you were, you were superb for Watford and, you know, what you do now for the club is still great, so, and, you know, they say never to meet your heroes, but... You're a top man, so I'm glad I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> I normally go for Tommy, for Tommy for comment now on that particular nominee, <laughs> but I think we'll, I won't make you talk about it. It's awkward. Yeah, it's awkward. Yeah, no, it's awkward, <laughs> isn't it? awkward but no. very much appreciated. Thank no, you. No problem. Um, and it wasn't forced, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, there is only one spot you get to pick, though. Um, and who have you chosen? I've gone for Troy. Um, I just think for what he offers on the pitch as well as what he, he's done off the pitch for Watford, the longevity as well. It's not many players that, that are at a club for that length of time and you know, he overcame some some bad moments in his life to, to go on and do this for us and again he was a huge part. I've gone for players that have played big parts in big moments in Tommy and Igalo, but you know, Troy again, that promotion season, he was unbelievable and then into the Premier League he probably got written off by one or two people. Um, but he stuck at it and you know, he was the voice on the pitch and off it. And uh, I don't think Watford would be where they are or have the history, recent history they've had without him being a big part of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, obviously, I, I know what he's been through. He put, took an awful lot on himself in the last couple of years as that leader, that talisman. Um, but on the pitch, you know, it's every, I suppose every era, it becomes more difficult to score goals. I understand that statistically. We go back to those that proves that. Um, and it'll be harder for the for the guys that we're yet to see in a Watford number nine shirt. But I, I, I think for everything that he's achieved, for all of the ups and downs, uh, and to keep scoring the goals against, you know, when Watford are not that team that's challenging for the top of the divisions, bar being in the championship, I think it's it, it, his stats and everything else he's done for the football club. Certainly, uh, he deserves that place in the team. And I think since he hasn't been here, or the spells where he was injured, I think that's when you realise what he was for the team. Um, I think we took him for granted, maybe at times, the goals he scored and the presence he had on the pitch as well. I know a lot of gets said about his presence off the pitch, but I think his presence on the pitch, the amount of games where you could visibly see him lifting his teammates, um, I think is huge and perhaps went undervalued at times. But yeah, for me, I think he's got to be in that in that 11. Okay, well here it is then. This is the 11 uh, for you with your selection in there. Your name is stamped upon it as well. So Troy Deeney is our first striker. We've got two more positions left to fill. There's still chance, Tommy, you could be partnering Troy Deeney up front, but we'll see. Or we could put you in the midfield. We could put, we can, you played in there as well. So you never know, there is still chance. Well, I've been denied a, 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 as a defender, <laughs> a midfielder and a, and a striker. I'm more than happy with that though. Right, final thing then before we let Helen get to training is uh, of course, uh, ask Helen. Tommy got two points. Uh, let's see how you get on for this one. Your first question. You have more international goals for Wales than Gareth Bale. But did he score more goals for Southampton or for Tottenham in his second spell when he came back on loan the other year? I'm going to say Tottenham. Correct. He scored five for Southampton, 11 for Tottenham I'm in that second spell. he was more spell. of a left back at Southampton yeah. at that point. So Correct. Yeah. One point on the board. Uh, question two, Tommy made his Watford debut against which current League One side, Sunderland or Sheffield Wednesday? There's no help <laughs> whatsoever there from Tommy. So 
Sunderland. Correct. Two points. <laughs> I could have stitched you up a trick. Yeah, you're looking, you're looking after me. I trusted you, yeah. see. Yeah, you, you can't do that. You're, you're one of the heroes. You can't, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, question three. Uh, we all know you have to chauffeur Adikita around, and she is <laughs> celebrating the new car today that you have got uh, as well as you are. Uh, but how old was she when she first joined Watford as a youth player? 12, 13 or 14? I'm going to go 12. Correct. Three points on the board. I do listen when she talks. <laughs> <laughs> Final question. Clean sweep if you get this right. The women's side have played several games at Vicarage Road this season. Of course, you are a fan and have come to many games here. But what is the capacity at Vicarage Road? 21,577, 20,577 or 22,577? I'm going to go middle of the road, 21. Correct. Um, whatever else she said. <laughs> Correct. Four out of four. And um, we have a bit of a tiebreaker question, which is quite a good one this week. So I'm going to ask Even anyway. Even though I've won. You've won. Okay. It doesn't mean anything. This is just for fun now. Okay. Um, but it's quite, quite an interesting one. We'll see how you get on. Um, Peter Shilton is the player who has the most professional appearances, both national and international. But how many games in total? Tommy gets to go first and then you get to go higher or lower. I'm going to give you a range between 750 and 1,750. So Peter Shilton has the most professional appearances, national and international. 1,033. 1,033. Higher or lower than 1,033? Higher. Higher. It is higher. 1,390 career wow. appearances. Do you want to know a fun fact about Peter Shilton? Go for it. He took my dad's place in a school football team as a goalie. Did he? Yeah. Great stat. And I didn't even know that. What a coincidence <laughs> of a question. Should have claimed I'd known that, shouldn't I? That would have maybe made up for earlier on. Right. Finally, final fans questions, of course, the important ones. Uh, these were sent a little bit earlier today. So a massive thank you to all of you who have done that. Kyle Brown would like to know, who was your idol growing up? Apart from Tommy. Apart from Tommy, course. obviously. Um, I was a big Michael Owen fan. Just the way he played. I sort of saw similarities in myself bit of pace in behind not quite got that pace anymore but um yeah those types of 1v1 in the box finishes that was kind of my game so he was certainly one of them complete nice. contrast to me then my style <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not i'm not a it's big fan of heading the ball yeah, yeah. uh Orn's shirts would like to know your best international experience um oh That's a really tricky one. Mm -hmm. um, I think you remember moments, I think it was around 2011 or 12, when we played France away, when big crowds weren't the big thing at that point. Um, we walked out to a stadium of 14, 15,000 in France and wow. their national anthem started playing and it was like, whoa, this is, this is serious. So I think that's, that one stands out. Nice. Um, I think playing England and getting a draw away to, uh, in Southampton, that was another one that stands out. Another big crowd, and uh, the first point we'd got against the top seed. Um, so yeah, those those two probably stick in the mind. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Mike would like to know what are the targets for the rest of the season and next season for the Golden Girls. Obviously, first and foremost, it's to stay in the division, um, and I think if we can do that, we can then have a good pre-season and a good off-season, sort some re good recruitment out. And I think we can push on and, and really challenge to be, you know, in a better position next year. But yeah, certainly first and foremost, it's to secure our, our position in the championship next season. Final question comes from your number one fan. Uh, the young fan called Addy has asked another question. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to you as well, Tommy. It'll be interesting to see the number. Uh, how many cream eggs can you eat in one sitting? Oh. I'm going to say more than five. More than five? Yeah. Okay. Tommy? I'm quite competitive. I'm going to say more than six. <laughs> more than six. <laughs> well, we've actually got a tray of cream. I'm joking. We haven't really. Um, amazing. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions that you've sent in. Um, Tommy, good to have you in as always. And Helen, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming in. Thank you for um, having me. We hope you enjoy training tonight. Um, well, everyone's sat at home watching this. Um, <laughs> but no, really appreciate it. And let massive congratulations once again on that 100th international cap as well. Thank you very much. Well, great to have Helen with us on the show tonight. Don't forget then you've got until Sunday for your season ticket renewals for that early renewal offer on that. Don't miss out some great prices on that watfordfc.com.
Train like a pro, we saw it a little bit earlier on the show, didn't we? If you want to get involved and have a go yourself, 90 minute coaching session at the training ground, tickets to come and watch Watford versus Burnley in there as well. Go to watfordfctrust.com. And the Herald and Post retro kit is now in store and online. If you like a bit of a retro kit, go and check it out. Well, a massive thank you to Helen and Tommy for joining us on the show tonight. Massive thank you to you as well for all your questions that you sent in earlier on during today. Uh, if you're coming to the game at the weekend, get behind the boys. Uh, they need your support uh, once again. And coming up next week for you, we've got another special guest in the studio here on Inside the Hive, a former Watford goalkeeping legend. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy the Easter bank holiday and I'll see you next time.